Welcome to Trade Ideas. I'm Alex Rosenberg here with Michael Purvis of Talbachen Capital Advisors. And before we get into everything we're going to talk about today, what's a uh, what's a Talbachen? Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you for asking. Thank you for having me back, um, Alex. So, uh, yeah, Talbachen is the name of my new firm. Uh, it's an obscure Swedish phrase referring to sort of a, a knoll with 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 uh, large uh, uh, pine trees on it. Actually, it's a slightly obscure reference, but uh, one I'm fond of. As you know, I've been you know for the last several years, I've been weed, at, at Weed and Company broker dealer. Um, the way the sell side is changing is that it's it's really kind of bifurcated. There is either trade execution over here, if you will, um, which is increasingly favoring large-scale um, heavy technology, or there's just content, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a uh, there's an unbundling of of how you know content and uh, trade execution is happening. And so, t for me, just looking prospectively, looking at some of the trends in Europe with MIFID and so forth, it just made it was eminently clear that just going to a, uh, a, a pure content model that we're the we're Clients, institutional clients, are just paying a monthly or quarterly fee um, for high quality advice. Good. Let, let's get some of that advice here. Okay. Um, last time you were on was in June. You talked about this divergence between what the bond market and what the equity market seemed to be looking at. You said it was almost like they were looking at two different sets of economic data with the bond market looking for much slower growth, maybe even recession, equity markets a, a lot more sanguine. And a lot's happened this week. We've gotten the Fed statement. We got Powell talking about how it's an insurance cut. We got another uh, tweet about tariffs from uh, the president. And then today, Friday, we got a jobs number that, you know, pretty good overall, pretty substantial wage growth at least. So given all that, who's, who has the upper hand? Who's winning this fight between stocks and bonds? I think one of this enduring things is this sort of enduring gulf between the, the bond market, when I say the bond market, I'm talking about the treasury market, mm -hmm. um, uh, on the one hand, and then the equity market, and I'll put credit with that as well, you know, high yield investment grade credit over here, right? And you ask me who's winning, well, in a sense, I guess they're both winning because the S&P's up 20% year to date, and if you went long treasuries, you've been doing great. But within that sort of both are winning condition, um, the question is, is what, what is the story between this two? Because still, okay, yeah, Powell gave us 25 basis points and, a, and a, a, it would seem to be a little bit more of a nudge that, hey, we're not, at the end, we're not starting a, a, cut, a cutting cycle, but you know, we could easily do more than just this one cut, right? So sort of between those two er areas, trying to thread a few different needles, which was you know, quite candidly, you know, for all the criticism that Powell gets, he has a very hard job when, on the one hand, there's an enormous gulf between where the rates markets, the bond market, the treasury markets decided to go over the last several months, on the one hand, and where his economic forecasts are, which are pretty much, by the way, right in line with Wall Street consensus forecasts as well, and most other institutional forecasts, whether it's IMF or World Bank or so forth, right? There, you know, there's variances, but they're usually marked by 10 or 20 basis points in terms of 2020 GDP and inflation, right? And then on the other hand, Powell also has to fight this battle in a sense with the White House, right? Because sure enough, you know, right after uh, Powell came on Wednesday, there was, you know, Trump was out there commenting that, hey, you know, look, he's not playing ball here, right? And this morning, um, Larry Kudlow was a uh, in the media discussing how, uh, look, you know, we've had highly restrictive monetary policy for the last two years um, uh, there. So, you know, he doesn't have an easy job, right? He's fighting a war on two fronts, the White House and the markets, and with a, with a huge gap between, between that. I think it's uh, how this gap gets resolved um, is A, going to require a lot of finesse from Powell, right? Finesse that he, a lot of people would say he hasn't actually mastered yet there. But frankly, you know, you could have the most articulate and nuanced uh, Fed chair ever in this role. It's a hard job to sort of navigate that, right? Because on the one hand, if he, let's say he doesn't give us a cut in September because the economic data is strong and the bond market is still heavily bullish rates, meaning that they're expecting yields to be lower for longer, um, across the curve, well, that's almost, you know, like giving a rate hike in, in a sense to the markets in terms of its jarring, and therefore he drives up the VIX, 
um, and he's and he's going to um, put you know a little bit more financial stress, and it's a little bit circular, right? Because then, of course, financial stress is one reason for him to 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 cut, right? So it's a very difficult condition um, there, um, and I think there's another dimension of this whole rates rally here, which is really important. I touched on it in June, but I think it's worth uh, talking about again, which is that the global rates market. Um, uh, has been one that's been even more extreme, of course, right? And um, look at the bond market where 10-year bonds are, you know, minus 40 basis points. They keep somehow making fresh lows. Now, we, we can debate the economic rationale of buying a bond with a, for 10 years with a negative 40-point yield on it. But nonetheless, that's where the markets are, are actually pricing that particular security, right? So one of the things that I think is a real conundrum for Powell is that He's talking about rest of world issues, rest of world weakness, um, the Eurozone, China, and so forth, as being this principal rationale for the insurance cut we just got, or for, in, in effectively, for any dovish policy we get prospectively. But my question would, to Powell would be, but sure, but a lot of that stuff is already reflected in these foreign bond markets, right? So when bonds are crazy low, that's reflecting real bad, real persistently weak economic condition in Germany and Europe and so forth. And those bond yields have been dragging down our treasury yields with it right now. Clearly, there's a the treasury market, the euro dollars market, the Fed funds markets are, are very focused on on what Powell's policy is going to be with respect to the Fed funds rate. Nonetheless, the correlation between the bonds and the 10-year Treasury yields has been spiking hugely as both yields came lower together, right? You know, there's always some correlation, but the correlation got really, really strong here. So play out a scenario into uh, later this summer or fall uh, where, you know, it sounds hard to imagine right now, but what if there's a big economic uptick in some of the Eurozone data? What if those Bund yields start climbing back to zero or up to positive 10, 20, 30 basis points, where they were for a lot of the last several years, even though the Eurozone data never got that great, right? In 2017, it was picking up, but it, it never really got back up. But still, from minus 40, 60 basis points is a scenario you have to consider. And given how strong the correlation has been with rates coming down together, is that going to lift the, certainly at least the 10-year back up and also not only re-steepen our treasury, our yield curves, um, but also sort of throw yet another monkey wrench into how Powell is processing all this data and all this market data, um, economic data and the market data. So if it seems like the bond market and the stock market are looking at different things, perhaps it's because they are. Maybe maybe earnings and the economy in the U.S. is strong enough for, for equities to remain bid. While the bond market, you know, that's a, a pool of yeah. investors who are thinking, do I want to buy U.S. Treasuries or do I want to buy bonds at, at negative rates? So, I guess if you're thinking about the chance of improving economic data in Europe, leading those rates to go higher, obviously negative for the bond market in the U.S. as well. I, I guess how correlated do you think that global economic data is, especially yeah. we're in a world with, with you know, de increasing trade tensions, increasing divergences between the political outcomes. I mean, just look at Brexit and, and all the other things that are happening in Europe that are not necessarily related to what factories are producing in the U.S. Yeah. I guess, you know, how, how does that economic correlation play into that market correlation? Yeah, it's a great question, um, and thank you for asking it. But, you know, look, the stock answer about the U.S. is that we're relatively insulated relative to certainly economies like China, the Eurozone. Um, and so forth, that uh, it's just we're, we're a lot more self-sufficient, and, and that's true. Having said that, if you look, talk about the U.S. equity complex, that is not insular, right? I mean, that is, if you look, if, you know, for discussions like just pretend the S&P is one giant company, right? It's a global multinational company where nearly 50% of its revenues come from overseas, um, uh, therefore, right? So even if, if our economy is more like 25%, the S&P is more closer to 50%, right? So there's a, you know, when you talk about the U.S. economy and you talk about the U.S. stock market, you have to first start with, you know, appreciating um, that difference there. The other thing that you were touching on is is that is that these um, there this economic correlation across countries and and look 
clearly the U.S. has been the outperformance story uh, relative to the rest of the world. It still is. That's sort of saying on the face of it that those correlations are, are relatively weak. But there's also things that kind of, you know, tend, tend to lag. The correlations have been remarkably strong between Eurozone, particularly a lot of the German manufacturing data and a lot of the Chinese economic data, right? Those correlations tend to be really stickier and stickier. So in the midst of this, this global situation where stocks and bonds are maybe looking at, at different things, of course, you know, all part of the global economy as, as we discussed, where is the greatest pain trade, do you think? Is it in stocks, is it in bonds, is, and, yeah. or is it in some other asset, and, and which way does that go? It, it's hard to figure out how people are, you know, when so many people are looking at different things, it's not like everyone's on one side of the boat necessarily. You know, that is a great question. Like, you, you, several minutes ago, you asked me, like, so who's winning, bonds or, or equities? And I said both. I would say, though, in terms of where the pain trade is, and I think that's a really good question, a way to sort of frame this discussion, where's, where's the asymmetric risk to the downside? And I would say, candidly, and it's a tough call to make, given how strong this bond market rally has been, right? But to my mind, I think there's still a very good case for rates in the United States to be going higher here, right? We talked about some of those um, scenarios where what if the Eurozone data gets better? What if the China stimulus starts taking hold and that ricochets into the Eurozone data and that lifts yields higher? That will be exported into our market over here and then you'll see a, you know, a quick rise up higher here. And at the very least, there's a lot of sentiment bulled up on that whole treasury notion, right? That, you know, 10-year yields are going to 1% and all that, and some people were even saying 0%. I'm not quite convinced that's that's the case. And then when you talk about where are people, how are people positioned, right? Well, look at the euro dollars positioning, right? If you look at the net speculative positioning relative to the total open interest, they're at seven-year highs, right? I mean, I mean, basically post-grape financial highs. So basically in the money markets, Everyone and their grandmother seems to be long euro dollars right now. That, to me, is a risk factor um, that, that uh, people are heavily on one side of the, of the boat. Equities, on the other hand, look, we've had, you know, year-to-date rally 20%. We came off those December lows. You know, it was supposed to be this, uh, oh, my God, you know, we're going to be, you know, it was part of that whole, like, we have trade and we're gonna, you know, Powell's going to hike us into a recession, right? And um, when we had that... You know, we've had a really solid risk rally here, but I'm not convinced that it took everyone with it, right? I don't see a lot of um, sentiment gauges that are where we're like, oh, my God, like, you know, um, it's not like every taxi driver sort of screaming about, like, you know, get it long Amazon, right? That condition, I don't see it. Um, either in the retail space or the institutional space right now. I think there's a, partly because of this bond market bid, there's a healthy skepticism about, oh my God, well, geez, you know, do I really want to play here? Do I want to be buying the market 20% up year to date when the bond market is sort of seems to be telling me there's a recession in 2020. So I don't think, you know, there's a, I think a lot of large scale allocators have been, uh, uh, de-risked equities, um, last year thinking it was sort of top of the eighth inning of this economic cycle. And a lot of, some of them have come back in, like the Norwegian Self Sovereign Wealth Fund was uh, public about, you know, buying that dip on late December, right? Which obviously was a brilliant trade. But I don't know how many of them are there. I think there's a lot of people that are still being very careful with, um, with risk right now, which means that there's room for the market uh, to rally further, or at least that if it does sell off, that maybe perhaps then those guys will come back in and, and be dip buyers. So I think right now my landscape is, is, that, is that if there's asymmetric risk to the downside, it's more in the bond market than there is in the uh, uh, equity market. I think people are really going to appreciate this perspective because we've had a lot of people come on Real Vision to be on what it's sounding like is the consensus side of the trade, you know, John Burbank coming on talking about buying call options on euro dollar futures, for instance, which is you know, sort of his way of play, this potential recession, lower rates, even going down to negative rates, potentially outlook. Yeah. So it, it's, it's first of all, really great to hear the other side. I, I think this is really useful just from, from a high level. If you were to advise anything tactical to kind of play off of um, this, this allocation and this uh, idea that people are playing for these lower rates, that if, if 
data turns around, especially in Europe, it could really turn the other way fast. How would you think about that tactically? Well, I, I think, look, if you're using ETFs, just simply speaking, you can look at the TLT and shorting that or buying puts on the TLT would be sort of an obvious way of rates going higher in the United States. Play. I think, I think within equities, I think uh, if rates do go higher, utilities have been extraordinarily aggressively bid, right? Just like euro dollars have been aggressively bid. It's sort of effectively the same trade. Those have a lot of torque to the downside if rates do in fact break. They're getting long banks um, would probably play um, as well, you know, if particularly if the back end increases higher and, and that you see those yield curves, you know, ranging a little bit more dynamically to the upside. Very good. Well, Michael, thank you for sharing this uh, contrarian perspective. I, I think the way you look at the world and make sense of the way assets are correlated and, and the way economies make sense together is going to be really useful for folks. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. You bet. So, Michael fears bonds may be overbought. And specifically, he thinks the potential for an uptick in global economic data could drive Treasury yields higher and bond prices lower. He recommends playing the setup with put options on the TLT. That was Michael Purvis of Tallbach and Capital Advisors. And for Real Vision, I'm Alex Rosenberg.